Thank you very much, uh, Farooq, for that very generous introduction. Um, as, as the topic uh, uh, suggests, I'm going to talk about India's maritime history. Um, and since this seems to be hope, uh, hosted out of uh, Mumbai, that's uh, perhaps uh, uh, entirely in sync uh, with uh, uh, what you have uh, right around you, Farooq. Um, but I think what I'm going to do here, rather than uh, uh, sort of try and go through the whole history of India uh, and try and link it to the, the um, yeah, to its maritime heritage, I will give you a sort of broad overview of maybe the uh, 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 you know uh, maybe up uh, over, uh, let's see how far I get once my uh, uh, on the time. But I'll try and give you a broad overview and try and give you a sense of the interlinkages that India had with our maritime neighbors from Oman to Indonesia uh, and so on. And the reason for that is very simple, because once you begin to think of uh, India as being part of a wider geography, you will begin to appreciate not only our history, uh, but even be appreciate uh, our current uh, circumstances. Otherwise, you see, uh, we tend to think of India uh, and its neighbors. On one side, we have China, and on the other side, we have Pakistan. But in fact, from a maritime perspective, if you think about it, we have many other neighbors too, with whom we have had very long uh, and interesting linkages. So uh, let's go back right to the beginning. So India has had a maritime history from the very beginning. And of course, like with every textbook that we will read, we tend to start with uh, the Harappan period. Now, right from the Harappan period, India has had a very strong maritime linkage. And as you all know, um, you know the, the, the Northwestern part of India had one of the earliest urban civilizations in the world, together with Mesopotamia, Egypt, China, and other places as well. And uh, we usually uh, think about, you know, the cities that are inland, uh, such as Mohenjo-Daro, Harappa, Rakhi Gadi, uh, Birana, and so on. But in fact, many of the most important sites of, um, uh, of the civilization are uh, along the coast, particularly in Gujarat. Now, in order to appreciate exactly what I mean by this, you actually need to understand that the landscape was very different from what you see today. So to understand that, first of all, you have to understand that, you know, what you now have as the peninsula of Saurashtra wasn't a peninsula at all. It was actually an island because sea levels were significantly higher. And Kutch also, the bit round Bhuj was also an island. And what is now the run of Kutch uh, actually was the estuary of two very major rivers. One was the Indus, which used to flow somewhat east of where it does today. And the other was a river that has now dried up <clears throat> called the Saraswati. But you can see from satellite photographs and other, uh, other evidence that it very clearly flowed into the run of Kutch. So this landscape that you then have with Saurashtra as an island and Kutch as an, also an island um, with uh, essentially the run of Kutch, the little run of Kutch, et cetera, being actually waterways, then explains the landscape in which uh, one of the biggest cities and possibly the biggest port of the Harappans was built, which was at Dholavira. Dholavira is today on a, an island, Khadir Island, but it's not an island out in water. It's surrounded essentially by the walled, uh, white salt flats of the run of Kutch. And on Khadir Island, when you go on, to, on, on, on there, if you ever visit Dholavira, which by the way is a phenomenally interesting place, you will immediately understand that this was obviously a port. And it is a very large settlement. And from here, voyages would be going, in some cases, up north along the Indus and the Saraswati when the initial phases when it was still flowing in full flow uh, into the inland cities. But interestingly for our purposes, since it's a maritime uh, history that we are talking about, uh, they could also go southward. And when they went southward towards the Konkan, they would have to go past a um, customs post. That customs post is what you know today as Lothal. So those of you who have visited Lothal, 
uh, will uh, when you visit there it has a very large dry docks kind of place where you can come and and, and dock uh, your ships but uh, the settlement itself is actually quite small but along this between the settlement and the docks there is a bunch of platforms and very likely those were basically customs platforms so the merchants would pull out their stuff and put it there and you can imagine the irs officers of that time peering suspiciously at the goods whether they were coming in or going out and then they would sail down further south similarly if you wanted to sail westward you would have to pay, sail past dwarka the name itself is interesting because it says gateway it means gateway and indeed there is a site there is a small island right next to dwarka called bet dwarka dwarka where a lot of harappan anchors and other artifacts have been found it was clearly a place where a lot of harappan ships used to anchor and from there they would sail out towards the gulf uh, the persian gulf and there's lots of evidence of harappan trade with this area whether with oman with uh, bahrain and then finally out there um with uh, mesopotamia so it is quite interesting that in the sumerian uh, sites in the cuneiform tablets there are mentions of a people called the meluhans who came from the east and they traded uh, peacock uh, feathers and ivory and beads and things which we all all of which are clearly uh, harappan um, uh, products we also have findings of harappan seals um and you have uh, you will find uh, beads and all kinds of other things which are clearly of harappan origin in all these places there is also a mention about the fact that there were harappan settlements uh, merchant settlements in and around um sumerian cities so today when you go to the to the middle east you find these uh, indian uh, communities living there but let me say that uh, indians have been living in and around the uh, the persian gulf from the very beginning and uh, sumerian in, uh, uh, sites uh, mentioned that these people used to come and there were large enclaves of them we also have uh, the mention uh, of individual meluhans and there's a very interesting story as a court case of which we have evidence in which uh, the court case in which the judge um <clears throat> advocates uh, uh, judge uh, 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 punishes a meluhan uh, several uh, silver coins for having punched and broken the tooth of a local in a drunken brawl so it's quite possible that this is the origin of prohibition in gujarat now this world that i just described was it its peak about 4500 years back to about 4000 years ago that's when the great harappan cities were at their full um, flourishing trade was going along the coast they were also also going inland but things were not quite right first of all the river saraswati on which a, a very large proportion of the harappan sites are based and it flows from um the the himalayas through haryana uh, rajasthan into pakistan and to the run of kutch uh, what is now the run of kutch uh, that river began to dry up then the weather also began to dry up and so very quickly or rather not so quickly over several centuries this pattern kept doing till about 2000 bc that's about 4000 years ago when there was a big drought and the climate system completely changed the saraswati river dried up completely and many of these harappan cities had to be abandoned dholavira itself uh, began to get marooned i suppose sea levels also began falling and so dholavira found itself marooned in the middle of the salt flats and uh, the entire network broke down now by the way this didn't only happen in india it happened also in the middle east the sumerian cities collapsed it happened in the in egypt where the old dynasty uh, cities also went through a collapse so they, this was a real climate catastrophe now what did the people of these of this uh, of the harappan cities do well those of the gujarat area well they moved we have some evidence of later harappan sites and this continuity culturally they seem to have moved on 
south west uh, south eastward towards the narmada and so on in the north they moved up following perhaps the dying tributaries of the saraswati they moved up further and further towards the origins towards the shivaliks some of them moved eastward onto the gangetic plains and we have evidence of groups like the mitani who turn up in the middle east so there were obviously some westward migrations as well now it is important here to point out that when these migrations into these new landscapes were happening they were not moving into empty landscapes there were people living there who had culture their own uh, cultures uh, they all uh, they now uh, the gangetic now new archaeology in the gangetic plains now suggests that um there was already a well developed culture there and many of the cities of the gangetic plains like varanasi may in fact be just as old as the harappan cities and they have survived to this day we have also had <coughs> recently a major finding in sinoli just east of delhi in in bagpat where we have found a full chariot um we have found uh, you know a helmet swords um uh, bronze uh, shields and all kinds of things and we can clearly see that this was a, a was a distinct culture obviously there were these two cultures were interacting but the gangetic culture was already a well established culture by the time that the harappans were declining and but it is with when the harappans began to move around these people the gangetic people must have interacted with them and that interaction um led to the development development of what we now know as uh, indian civilization now this must have happened in the south as well the problem is that so far we haven't found till very recently major um urban developments now clearly there weren't too many of them because we would have found them but there is some sites in a few places that we have now very recently begun to dig that there may have been some late bronze age sites even in southern india with their own culture and it's possible they were they were already trading with and interacting with the harappan people and of course there must have been some intermingling uh, with people from gujarat as they moved southward so all of this intermingling happened round about uh, in the in the uh, from 2000 bc onwards now the next phase of indian civilization now takes off with the coming of the iron age this was uh, of course a technological change but uh, it is quite interesting that the origins of it are not in northern india but in southern india particularly in and around the godavari valley and the earliest use of iron anywhere in the world happens in the godavari valley in fact the first dig interesting uh, the oldest findings are interestingly in hyderabad university itself to going back between 1800 and 2000 bc the first systematic use of iron anywhere in the world and this technology then begins to shift all over uh, first to the eastern uh, and central gangetic plains and then westwards outwards now i want to point out here that there is all this uh, talk about the aryan invasions but let me show you that there is no evidence of aryan invasion in any of the archaeology that i have just uh, discussed moreover uh if there was a technological uh, advantage that is supposed to have been with the aryans coming down from the central asia with their iron weapons against the bronze weapons of the harappans let me point out that iron technology is not a central asian but a south indian technology if there was any technological advantage it is the indians who had it moreover there is a lot of talk about horses as well here too let me point out that <clears throat> india actually had horses from a very early stage and in fact there may have been the horse itself may have evolved part of it the time in the uh, grasslands of northern india of course much much before the harappans uh, but uh, there are uh, cave paintings in places uh, in madhya pradesh for example where which go back 10000 years which depict horses so there were plenty of horses in india already i already mentioned uh, that the earliest chariot anywhere found anywhere in the world has been found in india in sanoli which is in the gangetic plains and we have some evidence some evidence that maybe 
the Harappans were importing horses from the Arabians as well. Um, so, <clears throat> just to put it in perspective, there were th this this world that I described does not require Central Asians at all uh, to be providing either the chariot or the horse or iron weapons because they were all found in India well before the so-called Aryan invasion that people bandy about around 1500 BC. Now, what happens is, of course, the Iron Age takes hold. Many of the cities of that period are cities that are we still know about because this is the period of the uh, Iron Age uh, and the epics. And then what happens from a maritime perspective, we begin to see a new maritime dynamic emerge. And this emerges not so much on the West Coast, but on the East Coast, in and around what is now Odisha and West Bengal. So between the westernmost outlet of the Ganga, which is the which we now call the Hukki, Hugli, and Lake Chilika, there is a that coastline. <clears throat> because you see this explosion of um, uh, small Iron Age ports popping up, and the Bengali Uriya merchants begin to explore this uh, coastline. Some of them go southward. And they go along the coast and they begin to arrive in uh, Sri Lanka. So it is quite interesting that the Sinhalese people of Sri Lanka today um, have a culture that is derived interestingly from this period and not from next door from uh, the Tamil Andhra coast, but from further north uh, from the Uriya Bengali area. Uh, and they have uh, in their own legends, their myths, they talk about the arrival of a, a prince uh, 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 from the land of Vanga uh, called Prince Vijaya, who arrives and he kind of established a kingdom in Sri Lanka. So it is, it is this uh, legend which is contained in a text called the Mahavamsa that is the origin myth of, uh, uh, of Sri Lanka. Now what happens is that while the, the, the merchants are going south, note that they are not going out, they are not yet capable of crossing the seas because they are still uh, in a state where they are just exploring. They don't, they, they, they don't yet know the monsoon winds. They can't sort of sail right across um, to Indonesia at this stage. What they are doing is just going along the coast. So just like they're going along the coast southward, some of them go begin to explore the coast in the other direction as well. And you begin to see Indian merchants turning up in, in uh, Burma, then in uh, what is called the Isthmus of Kra. This is the bit of, uh, of uh, Thailand near Phuket from which uh, Malaysia hangs. So when they arrive at the Isthmus of Kra, they just have to walk a relatively short distance onto the other side and then they are in the Gulf of uh, Thailand. And from there, they would sail out even further towards what is now Vietnam and Cambodia and so on. And so in the Mekong Delta, they began to turn up by about the, you know, we don't have dates, so I'm, we are just guessing here, but somewhere around the fourth, fifth century BC, they begin to turn up in these areas. And perhaps some of them were even making their way further out towards China. Now, we do not know exactly who these people were who were going there in our own storylines. But interestingly, some of their stories have been preserved in the stories of the charms of Vietnam and the Khmer's of Cambodia. And one of the very popular stories goes somewhat like this. That a long, long time ago, there was a Indian merchant ship um, that was sailing along and it was attacked by a bunch of pirates from, uh, from that Mekong Delta area. So uh, uh, on board, the captain who was a uh, handsome young Brahmin called Kondinya, he rallied his crew and they fought the pirates away. But unfortunately the ship now had you know, developed some leaks and so they had to take the ship and beach it and they began to repair it. Unfortunately, a local tribe, a Naga tribe turned up and surrounded them. And it looked like they were going to get massacred because you know they were completely 
uh, outnumbered. Nevertheless, Kondinya again rallied his crew and they were going to fight and defend themselves. But situation looked quite hopeless. This is when luck turned in their favor because the leader of this tribe was a warrior princess called Soma, who saw Kondinya and fell in love. And she proposed marriage to Kondinya. I suppose Kondinya didn't have too much choice in the matter, so he agreed. And they got married and they set up the kingdom of Funan, which is the first Indianized Hindu kingdom in that part of the world. And from then on, it is quite interesting for the next almost 1,500 years or more, all the kingdoms and dynasties that emerged in this part of the world, whether it's of the Chams of Vietnam or the Khmers of Cambodia, they would all try and find some way of creating a link to this marriage between Kondinya and uh, Soma. Now the question is, who was Kondinya? Now the problem here is that none of our inscriptions tell us who is Kondinya. The, however, we have a clue. We have a clue in the sense that Kondinya, even in ancient times, was not a common name. It's actually the name of a gotra. And that gotra, interestingly, exists even today between southern Odisha, the Andhra coast, and northern Tamil Nadu, that coastline. So it is possible that the Kondinya we are talking about was somebody who came from a, one of the Brandman clans from that region. But of course, we are guessing here. Now what happens is that as time passes, the voyagers become, voyagers become more and more uh, confident because obviously people are going back and forth, more and more information is getting uh, accumulated and major ports begin to pop up. So on the East Coast, for example, you begin to see you know, significant uh, settlements in and around the Chilika Lake area. You have Chandraki Etugar, just north of Kolkata. And then by the Mauryan period, you have another major port called Tamralipti, now known as Tamluk, not far from IIT Kharagpur. So these were the big ports on the East Coast. Meanwhile, on the West Coast, you begin to see trade happening with uh, initially the Greeks and then later on with the Roman empires. Now, notice as trade begins to grow, the, the merchants also begin to get a sense of the kinds of, um, uh, about the kinds of winds that they are uh, facing. And they discover that the monsoon winds have a peculiarity that they blow in one direction for one part of the year. And then they flow in exactly the opposite direction another part of the year. Now for sailing ships, this is godsend because it means that you can go to some place at one point and then a few months later you can sail right back. So <clears throat> what we see is that more transoceanic rather than coastal shipping begins to take off. And we have a very good uh, sense of this because there is a, 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 a sailor's manual from a, written by a Greek um, uh, navigator uh, from the first century AD, uh, probably from the city of Alexandria that we have got. And it describes step by step how you make your way to India uh, from Alexandria. So this is how, in the first century AD, uh, merchants would have Roman merchants would have come to India, and I presume Indian merchants going outward would have done this in reverse. So what would have happened is that you would have the merchants from, say, the Alexandria would have first sailed up the Nile, some part of the way, and then they would have crossed across the little bit of the Sahara to the Red Sea. From the Red Sea, they would then trade their way down the Red Sea out towards uh, the uh, Arabian uh, Sea. And before sailing on, they would come and there was a big settlement in an island called Sokotra, which is even there today. You can look it up. It's a part, it's an island just off the coast of Yemen. And they would go there and they would um, sort of rest there. There was already a significant number of Indians there. In fact, the name Sokotra itself is derived from Dwipa Sukhdhara, or the island of bliss. And from Sokotra, there would be one group who were, wanted to go to Gujarat. They would sail up north towards uh, Oman and then eastward to 
uh, Gujarat. But those who wanted to go to Kerala or the, the Konkan coast, now because they knew the, the winds quite well, they would then use these monsoon winds to go directly across to Kerala. And there was a major port. Um, there were several posts along, but there was a very particularly major port in Kerala called Muchiri Patnam or what the Romans called Muzaris. The same thing was meanwhile happening on the East Coast. So you had uh, merchants, by this time, the entire coastline trade, uh, on the East was trading. So you would have perhaps have Tamil, um, Andhra coast, the entire coastline was, you know, lots of trade going back and forth. So if you started out Tamralipti, you would probably um, st start out, go, go out through the Sundarbans, out into uh, the Bay of Bengal. Then you would trade your way along the coast. You'd go down the Odisha coast, the Andhra coast, and so on, all the way down to Sri Lanka. Then, from Sri Lanka, somewhere near Trincomalee, you would then use the uh, um, transit oceanic currents and sail eastward to um, Sumatra. There you had two choices. You could either go down uh, the Malacca Straits, which is between Sumatra and, and the Malay Peninsula, or you could go on, on, down south to the Sunda Strait between uh, Java and Sumatra. And then you could further sail out eastward to all the way through uh, towards, uh, you know, Vietnam and Cambodia and China and all the way to um, uh, Japan and Korea. In fact, Japanese history starts, interestingly, with the marriage of a local prince to a princess from Ayodhya. So there was obviously a lot of influence going. Uh, you know, I, Hindu and Buddhist ideas were also transported along, along with the goods. So there was a lot of traffic going back and forth. Now, what is the records of all of this in India? Well, it turns out by this time, we begin to see a lot of... Uh, uh, artifacts, um, both on the Indonesian side and on the Indian side. And you can see a lot of giving and uh, back and forth uh, happening. Uh, for example, uh, you have heard of the Pallavas. Uh, now the Pallavas <clears throat> were a dynasty that ruled much of Southern India um, <clears throat> uh, with their capital just east of uh, uh, what is uh, now Chennai uh, in Kanchi, Kanchipuram. And their main port was south of Chennai uh, in a place called Mahabaleshwara. Now, this dynasty itself is interesting because, um, you know, there's a lot of debate about what the male lineage of this dynasty is. But in fact, it is interesting, uh, it, is, uh, it is quite curious that the Pallava inscriptions themselves don't seem to give a very clear indication about what their own male lineage is. There's a conflict, they seem to conflict each other. What it does suggest, however, what they really seem to have paid more attention to was the female lineage, because no matter what the story is of their founding of their dynasty, it all starts with one of their ancestors marrying a Naga princess. Now the question is, where did the Naga princess come from? And in my book, Ocean of Churn, I've made a case that this Naga princess was almost certainly from Southeast Asia. Either she was from, uh, <clears throat> um, uh, she was from Indonesia or Malaysia, or she was from Cambodia. And so there were clearly a lot of uh, interlinkages, but we do have a very interesting story from this period, which you will find fascinating. That, Somewhere in the eighth, early 8th century, the Pallavas had a real, faced a major crisis. And the crisis was this, that the, the, the Pallava king had died and he had not left behind any heir. So there was a lot of panic that the Chalukyas would finally come in, who were the mortal enemies of the Pallavas, the Chalukyas would finally come in and conquer the Pallavas. So all the chieftains, all the scholars, priests, uh, governors, uh, <clears throat> the royal family all gathered together in Kanchipuram and had this grand conference to decide now what should be done. When somebody remembered that uh, about three, four generations earlier, the younger brother of the um, 
Pallava king called a gentleman called Bhima had gone off to sailed off to a far off land and married a local princess there and stayed there so somebody came up with the idea why don't somebody sail to this other kingdom and see if any of the descendants of bhim were willing to come back to india and become um the ruler after all they were also pallavas so a delegation of brahmin scholars was put together and they went to mahabalipuram and they sailed across and you know the, 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 then they sailed they seemed to have traveled quite some distance through forests and so on and anyway they eventually reached the uh, um the court of this king uh, who uh, or prince who was the descendant of uh, of bhima and asked for one of his sons now it turned out that he had four sons but the first three sons declined to go and I, i mean i probably don't blame them in those days it was probably quite suicidal to be going off like this uh to some place that they had no idea about but the youngest son who was only 10 or 11 years old he agreed that he would come so he got into the he went back came back with the delegation sailed back to mahabalipuram came to kanchi and he was crowned the king and he, then there is the stories of how he fought with the chalukyas and chased them out and so on now the story is interesting because <clears throat> you suddenly have the story that one of the that that one of the great kings of south india his name by the way was nandi varman the second which is the title that this boy took after he became king was in fact not indian but uh, of southeast asian origin and the reason we know this story is interestingly because he himself has left this in inscriptions in a temple that he built in kanchipuram and if you visit that place it's if and you will be able to see that not only has he inscribed the story he has also depicted this in series of panels and if you look at those panels you will see that many of the characters in those panels have features that are clearly not from southern india they are clearly panels of people with oriental features that are from southeast asia so i thought it was you would find it interesting that one of the greatest kings of southern india nandi varman the second was um either a, a indonesian or a malaysian or a, or a or a cambodian from the, somewhere in that general area so um as i said time continued to move forward and trade links continued to grow there was enormous influence of southeast asia as you all know in uh, 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 there's an enormous influence of india on southeast asia as you all know um the largest hindu temple in the world is not in india it's in cambodia angkor wat um there is a lot of influence of buddhism of course in that part of the world uh, but there is also influence of that part of the world in india i told you about the story of the pallavas but there are many many little things that uh, we to this day uh, commemorate in our culture which relates to southeast asia for example um you have uh, the eating of pan and supari Uh, you'll find it interesting to know that pan and supari are not indian but are actually southeast asian uh, uh plants uh, that uh, was brought to india from our trade with southeast asia so uh, even today in certain parts of southeast asia uh, they uh, have pan supari it's not as elaborate as in india but pan supari and a little bit of lime is still eaten in many parts of southeast asia so that's where it originally comes from um now there's a huge amount of trade going back and forth clearly and by the time of the cholas this is you know the highway of the world we hear a lot about the silk route but in fact most of world trade was actually maritime and not on bactrian camels through central asia this was the backbone the, you can call it the spice route or whatever you may look, like to call it and there was a lot of trade going back and forth the indians were of course exporting um uh, spices like black pepper but it's important to remember many of the spices that indians were exporting to the europeans were actually in spices from indonesia that the indians had purchased from the indonesians and were passing on to the uh to the greeks romans arabs as as the time flowed but india's own exports very often tended to be things like textiles that was the very important export and interestingly also 
steel uh, goods, particularly weapons. Uh, so India has a long history of exporting uh, weaponry and the Damascus sword, which was uh, uh, very often, uh, which was used by the Arab armies to fend off the Crusades was made uh, 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 using an Indian technology. And it's very likely that at least some of, some of the equipment was directly imported from India. So this is the world we were in till about the 10th, 11th century. And since I'm running out of town, not time now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Roma, about the geopolitics of the Chola period before I uh, open it up for Q&A. What I was going on in, in that time was that world trade was, as I mentioned, was along the sea route and connected the empire of the Fatimids of Egypt um, through, through the uh, Arabian Sea to the Chola Empire, which controlled much of Southern India. Then going eastward through the Srivijaya Empire, which controlled what is now Sumatra, uh, through Sumatra. And um, uh, in order, and, and of course, there were the various Javan kings uh, of Java, Shailendras and others. And there were two routes you could take. You would go either by the Malacca route or the Sunda, route, uh, Sunda Straits. And then you could sail all the way to east to the Song Empire of China. Now, what happened is uh, around about uh, the very first decade of the 11th century, the uh, Javans began to threaten the Sumatrans. And the Sumatrans asked for uh, support from the Chinese. So the Chinese Song Empire gave them a lot of support. So using the support of the Chinese, the Srivijaya Empire began to push back the Javanese. And they were so successful in doing this that they suddenly came in control of both the Malacca Straits and the Sunda Straits. Now suddenly, East-West trade was controlled for the first time by the same, uh, same empire. And they were perhaps also creeping into uh, the uh, other route, which was through the Isthmus of uh, Kra. So they did what all monopolists do. They began to hike up the tariffs on goods passing through their lands. Now this clearly irritated the Cholas and Rajendra Chola in 1017 sent a small expedition to threaten the Srivijaya. But it clearly didn't work. So in 1025, Rajendra Chola put together a very large fleet from Nagapatnam. Um, that port, it's still there in Southern India. And from there, a very large fleet sailed out. Uh, as I said, the route would have been first sail south towards uh, Sri Lanka, and then swing eastward across to Sumatra, the west coast of Sumatra. From there, they seem to have sailed south towards the Sunda Straits and Java. It's quite likely that they probably got refueled a bit by their allies, the Javans. And then they made their way through the Sunda Straits and then up north towards what, uh, Singapore, and then essentially along the way up the Malacca Strait, sacking all the uh, Srivijaya ports on the way. And then finally in a climactic battle um, in Kadaram, which is now Kedah in Malaysia, they completely destroyed the Srivijaya um, army. And having done that, they then sailed back no, went further north and sailed back past the Nicobar Islands. So we know about this again because of the copper plates left behind by Rajendra Chola about his exploits. And um, it is also interesting here that the Chinese did not do anything, as far as we know, to support the Srivijaya when the Cholas made this raid. Uh, and a few years later, the Cholas and the Srivijaya did a joint embassy to the Song um, King, uh, Song Emperor's court. Now, we do not know why that is the case that the Chinese did not help the Sumatrans when the uh, Indians came and raided them. It's quite possible that they were just as irritated by the high tariffs that the Sumatrans had placed on them, or whatever other reason may be the case, we do not know. But it, it is an interesting that this entire episode suggests that the Indian Ocean has been a place of geopolitical maneuvering for a very long time in which both the Indians and the Chinese have been uh, both collaborating and competing for a very, very long time. 
with that i'm going to stop because i think i have spoken now for almost 45 minutes continuously and i'm sure there are some questions that would be interesting to the audience back yeah. to you sir thank you mr sanyal that was you've turned over quite a few myths that we believed in taught in right from our school days i'm going to begin with the first question about the aryans uh you've turned that myth about the aryan invasion on its head uh we've always been taught in our primary schools about invasion uh were the historians wrong or did it suit a particular narrative to uh talk about the aryan invasion so you know it's quite amazing that we in india have perpetuated this aryan invasion myth because it's it's very it's a very thinly uh veiled uh racial theory of white superiority mm -hmm. what the british were doing whenever we were entering and taking over some place they were making basically the point that we have come here to give you civilization so mm -hmm. this is what they did when they went to australia this is what they did they went to new zealand and every other place the problem is when they came to india there was obviously an existing civilization mm -hmm. so they created this new myth saying that look this this myth that this culture you are proud of was given to you by these people called white people called aryans who came from the north and they gave you this culture and all we are doing is giving you a software update okay and interestingly they also created similar things in africa hmm. which the africans have thrown into the bin but let me tell you there's something called also called the hemetic invasion theory uh -huh. okay so the country of zimbabwe for example is named after a series of um stone cities um called zimbabwe the capital of that empire was zimbabwe and these ruins were they are pretty significant ruins you can still go and see them and it's we know today that it is quite clearly local shona people who had built it in a, in a kingdom and these cities but when they were originally discovered uh the europeans made the story that no no these local Uh, black people are you know can't possibly have built this so some group of people must have come from europe uh -huh. and have built these and so they called it the hemetic invasion theory mm -hmm. and for a very long time as recently as the 1970s when zimbabwe was rhodesia it was actually illegal to say that the cities of zimbabwe uh, were actually uh, built by black people you could actually get jailed for saying so oh wow. so now of course we have more than adequate evidence because you know we have dug up uh, bodies of kings and queens and done dna analysis is quite clearly that they are linked to the shona people the same thing is by the way known of now we are getting in interesting information about who are these people who are living in these uh, cities so the interesting part here is this you see the saraswati river is a very important part of the rigvedic text mm -hmm. now the way the aryan valas used to uh, say it, that uh, try and explain it away by saying that there was another saraswati river somewhere in central asia or mm -hmm. afghanistan and so on. this is utter nonsense because the rigveda clearly tells you where the the saraswati is there is something called the nadi stuti suktam all of you can google it up don't have to take my word for it and it mentions that the saraswati it it lists out all the rivers of northern india by the way or not northwestern india and starts with the ganga and it lists them out in order so it says o ganga yamuna saraswati shutudru and so on shutudru by the way is satluj so <clears throat> we know that whatever this river was was between the yamuna and the satluj right so okay. we also have another uh, chant in the uh, rigveda which says this river comes down from the snowy mountains to the ocean mm -hmm. okay now so we know that it it is between these two rivers and there was this thing so that if you now take the trouble to look into a uh, google maps you will see there's a dry river bed right there correct you now call it the ghaggar we can also see that it goes right all the way down to the run of kutch mm -hmm. which is the reason the reason that dholavira was built there that was the estuary of this big river mm -hmm. we know from ground studies that it was a massive river then it began to dry up 
and then ultimately fully dried up around 2000 BC. That process incidentally is described in post-Vedic texts because the drying up the Saraswati is a very major theme yeah, yeah. In, in many texts, including the Mahabharat, mm -hmm. where, for example, Balram goes during, during the Kurukshetra war, Balram, who is the brother of Lord Krishna, refuses to fight the war and he goes on a tirth. And we are told that he starts in Gujarat and he makes his way up the dry riverbed okay. of the Saraswati. And we are told it's drying up till he make, makes his way to a place called Vinashana. Because by this time, and I don't know where this is, we don't know, but it was probably somewhere in northern Rajasthan. The rivers were still flowing up to that point. Oh. And he mentions that the river flows up to Vinashana and then disappears into the desert. But up to this point, there is still a large number of cities, etc. And he's been, but beyond that, it is all Maru Bhumi or the desert. Maru, yeah. So, yeah, so you can you can see the landscape is clearly described. Mm -hmm. Okay, number one. Number two, the genetic studies are also very interesting. The basis of the Aryan invasion theory is that not only do the, uh, you know, the Sanskritic languages have a link to European languages, which is obviously quite remote, but it has a very close relationship with the Western languages, which is old, old Persian, the Western Persian. And if you read the Zend Avesta, which is the holy book of the, of the uh, Parsis, you can clearly see that the Rigvedic language and the Avestan language, they are almost identical, but for certain changes in pronunciation. For example, sir becomes her. For example, by the way, the same thing happens even today in Assamese. Ah, so if you make those corrections, you can read the Zend Avesta. In fact, very interestingly, this language of the Zend, the original Avestan Gathas is closer to Rigvedic Sanskrit than Rigvedic Sanskrit is to classical Sanskrit or the Avestan, Avestan is to later Persian. So these two languages are clearly very clear, closely related. So this was said that how did they get related? They must have come from a common source. That's a fair point. But the point is, where is that common source? The, so the source was given because it now fitted into this northern theory. So it must have come from Central Asia. Mm. Now just open up a map. Okay, now let me show you why that does not fit at all. First of all, India and Iran are right next to each other. To go from India to Iran, you don't need to go to Central Asia. Right? Yes. Especially because we know the climate was different and that Baluchistan was a grassland and people were going back and forth. There are plenty of Har Harappan sites in Balochistan. Yes. Right? So people were clearly going between Eastern Iran. There was a civilization called the Giraffe civilization, which is clearly closely related to Harappan civilization. So these people were, there is also a maritime link, which is the one I was talking to. So there were people going by ship and they were going by land and there was lots of trade going back and forth. So why on earth do you know Central Asia, the Harappan, people clearly had a link with the uh, Eastern Iranian people we, and they, the uh, Giraffe civilization uses humped camel, uh, humped uh, bulls, for example, in their art. And you, we know that Harappans have humped bulls, very much important part of their art as well. Similarly, when you talk about the horse, we know that the horse was well known in Southern areas than in Northern areas. Right. Why? For very simple reason. Till 8,000, 9,000 years ago, Central Asia was so cold that nothing lived there. Forget about um, uh, horses. There were no human beings also living there. Nothing was living in Central Asia. In fact, Central Asia is even more, even very cold even today. But during the Ice Age, it was frozen solid. So there was nobody living there. Whoever ended up living there went from the south. So, so for, wait. Huh, so so yeah. I'll give you one last thing, which is so logical. The other th thing is that, oh, they all came in chariots. Please look at a map. If you even started out somewhere in, in, in Central Asia on a chariot, once you attempted to go through Afghanistan on a chariot, you would definitely abandon it. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. The only place it becomes useful again after several thousand kilometers uh, of crossing, crossing all of that is when you reach, reach Haryana. In the plane. Even Punjab, it's not very helpful because Punjab is full of sand and river 
it's sandy and river and uh, you know that it has marsh and all kinds of things so a chariot is not even very useful in 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 punjab it's when you hit haryana and western up that is where a chariot is useful and interestingly we have found the earliest chariot in the world is in bagpat is it yeah in sinoli oh yes two years ago we found it so it all fits together so what is the story as far as the horses are concerned also we know that the horses existed in india before in, in stone age forget about and in the vedic texts incidentally we know that the horses are linked to the sea it's very interesting there is a everything you know the horses of the sea the ashwin twins were the mm. horse twins they all linked they are all linked to the ocean mm mm-hmm. why are they linked to the ocean well one possibility is because they were importing from arabia and other places they were importing horses we know that arabian horses from a very early stage were very prized so this mm. is a southern story this is not a northern story so um, there was a there was a film on the bagpat site sites uh, on discovery plus a little while ago uh, yash chandra yash chandra wants to know what do these findings at sinali suggest about our civilization so one important thing that you have to understand <clears throat> is that our textbooks and is the evolution of the first of all we have to uh, this idea was that people were sitting around hunter gatherers in india till civilized civilization came with the aryans mm-hmm. that theory was sort of given a big jolt with the discovery in the 1920s so it's not that long ago but 100 years ago the discovery of the harappan cities so they but they didn't throw out the aryan invasion theory instead they said there were these people yes but the aryans came and destroyed the cities and then that's how indian civilization came now we know that there was no aryan the- uh, invasion we know that these cities were abandoned because of climate change that is more than adequate evidence to this show this and that we also show that there is continuity of this civilization afterwards so there's no sudden breakdown mm-hmm. what you see is the cities are abandoned and they go back to living in small villages because they don't have water and they begin to grow different crops so they were growing wheat rice etc and they now begin to grow millets and other things which require less water but there is still continuity for several hundred years and then it begins to merge with other civilizations now the, the point that i was making earlier as well is that we still tend to think that the harappans were the only civilization going and the rest of us were sitting around twiddling our thumbs that's not the case because we now can we are now finding these sites all around the indic the gangetic plains which are just as old the sanoli one is about 2000, 2000 bc or thereabouts but this is a clearly a well developed civilization when it's being found it's not an early civilization these chariots these uh, bronze weapons these are clearly the the doings of a very well established civilization and its artwork and technology and are somewhat different from those mm-hmm. of harappans so this is a somewhat distinct group of people some would call it the copper horde or whatever people okay and oh, then so- sorry yeah. and sorry. then you have these kinds of sites going all the way so you're finding sites in and around prayagraj which are quite old bronze age sites mm. there are some indications that kashi itself varanasi is just as old as the harappan sites and since we are now beginning to think about this differently it's quite possible southern india also has these sites now interestingly this would fit our own traditional view of how india was mm. because there is no sense in in, in our uh, puranic literature or vedic literature of people going and settling a third place they seem to be interacting with people and they seem to be people who are interacting with even further people so when you know, people goes on a balram goes on a tirth or something or arjun goes all over the country and reaches all the way to manipur they are clearly all populated places mm-hmm. and their cultures are somewhat different but there's also clearly these are not completely unknown territories they're going into so already by the iron age you are dealing with a group of people where we had been trading with each other perhaps a significant amount of give and take uh, of culture had happened and sort of a composite culture was developing so for a nation with such a rich maritime history when did this taboo about crossing the oceans come into the picture so it, it is very clear that at least till uh, the uh, period of the uh, cholas which is mm-hmm. 
12th century, up till the 12th century, uh, Indians were clearly quite uh, enthusiastic about crossing the seas. Mm. Um, and in fact, it's quite interesting uh, that uh, the most enthusiastic about crossing the seas seem to have been the Brahmins, who seem to be very highly prized in the royal courts in you know, Indonesia and other places. And many of them made their way all through to places like Vietnam and married local girls and so on. I told you that story. Yes. And they must have been doing it, and they seem to have been doing it on the West Coast as well, uh, you know. So it's not very clear when, but it does suggest that around about the 13th, 14th century, this taboo began to emerge. Now, why it emerged, I have not solved it. I have been looking for the answer. But it is quite interesting that uh, there seems to have been a major shock to Indian civilization and the ecosystem of civilizations that existed around about the early 13th century okay. due to invasions from Central Asia. So as I told you, the trade was between the Arabs of the Middle East, the Indians and the Chinese. And at about the same time, first the you see this huge invasion of Turkic invasions into India, which causes mayhem. But just a little bit later, the Mongols also turn up and they invade, of course, they, they, they destroy the homelands of the Turks. But they, on both sides, they sack Baghdad and cause chaos in the Middle East. And on the other side, they you know, sack uh, the Chinese empires. Mm. So these waves of Central Asians basically cause mayhem in the three civilizations that emerge. The, the Chinese, the, the Middle Eastern Arab civilization, and the Indic civilization. Mm. They are completely given this radical shock by these invaders and it's it, it it's devastating to all three of them what is interesting is however that the chinese ultimately a few centuries later you know chase out the mongols and they re-establish themselves re then in uh, same thing happens in the middle east the mongols are finally chased out but in india um the turkic kingdoms continue to be there and you begin to see uh, in fact, the Mongols make a later invasion as well. After mm. the Mughals are Mongols. Yes. Uh, and somehow the uh, re-establishment of mer uh, mercantile culture does not happen. Even though you have the Vijayanagar Empire in southern India, mm. uh, it, it is interesting that the Vijayanagar Empire, although it depended heavily on trade, uh, on maritime trade, it didn't develop its own maritime culture. It itself remained largely, from what we can gather, a terrestrial empire. So there is no evidence of a large, uh, you know, Vijayanagar navy. They had a large army, but not of a large navy which was going and doing things all over. So I, as I said, I am not quite sure why uh, in Indians and I would say Hindus in particular developed this taboo. But it was not always entirely. Uh, what should I say? Uh, Entirely. So, for example, the Gujaratis, particularly the Kachis, continue to sail, uh, including the Hindus. Mm -hmm. And you do have uh, other groups also doing some sailing, Chettiars and so on. Okay. But yes, I mean, compared to the glory days of the of the Pallavas and Cholas, etc., there certainly seems to have gone into decline. You brought into the picture a, to a different uh, manager alliance with Japan. While the one of the Ayudhya princes with uh, Korea. Korea was known, uh, you brought in Japan too. Yes. So there is a lot of trade going back and forth clearly with that region. Mm. And we have, for example, Pallava and Chola uh, period um, uh, Hindu temples that are built all along the Chinese coast Yes, um, <clears throat> that have been found. Uh, they are even um, Some of them are still in use, although... They have now uh, appropriated to Chinese goddesses, but the 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 uh, the idol is still the same. It clearly is a South Indian idol that is worshipped still in some of these temples. But what Japan? Yeah. But Japan also has this. Uh, it imbibes a lot of culture coming through, and to this day, uh, uh, Shinto temples across Japan have shrines to Saraswati shrines to Ganesha, to Indra, 
and uh, buddhist temples interestingly there conduct vedic yagyas to this day and the word mm-hmm. shinto by the way is derived directly from the word sindhu which by the way is the same root yeah. of hindu correct so there is clearly huge influence of hinduism which in in the east in the west the word sindhu becomes hindu but in the east it becomes shinto and shintoism is essentially local animism combined with hinduism hinduism so rahul wants to know what is the earliest instance of use of naval uh, navy as we know it today so uh, there are um, some uh, examples of this uh, which are there uh, there is i think if i remember correctly either in an inscription or in one of the sangam texts uh, a, a, a story of how a chera king the cheras used to rule over what is now kerala a chera king uh, fought with uh, a neighboring uh, group of uh, um, kingdoms and then he also as part of that um captures a bunch of uh, greek and arab um merchant ships uh, so there is a mention of that i don't know off the top of my head right now they can't remember the story but there is i think somewhere i think the second century uh, bc or second century ad from from that period uh there is an instance of the cheras using um um you know a, some sort of a, a naval ship to uh, do this so did the cheras precede the cholas or were they did they come afterwards or were they no. timeline this, this is a very interesting facet of southern or the southern tip of india i won't call it southern because south includes karnataka telangana andhra etc but the very southern tip of india which is uh, tamil nadu and kerala have a very interesting history <coughs> of a triangular battles between three clans over a very long you know hundreds of years so one of the clans were the cholas mm-hmm. who came from tanjavur you had the pandyas who came from madurai and you had the cheras who came from kerala area kerala and these three clans were essentially at war with each other over hundreds of years mm. and uh, sometime you know depending on the situation two of them would gang up against the third or whatever and the sri lankans were also involved in this <clears throat> because they would very often uh, build alliance with the, the uh, madurai uh, pandyas mm. so the, so the most feared of this lot seem to have been the cholas <clears throat> they seem to have been the most aggressive so, so very often you have the sri lankans and the madurai kingdom ganging up against the cholas oh so quite ironical given recent history of tamil sinhalese conflict yes yes it was actually the conflict was mostly within the tamils with the sinhalese taking side taking mm-hmm. one side uh, against the other mm-hmm. uh, and the cheras would come into that picture from time to time mm-hmm. on one side or the other so uh, this is basically the politics of the southern tip of india for very long periods of time you would have occasionally you know another dynasty like the pallavas or somebody else turn up but this triangular battle uh, went on for a long long time um amit's observation is that uh, uh, southeast asian languages like khmer have a lot of sanskrit words were they were there many ring- linkages with that part of india with that part of the world i think you clarified that quite adequately um i think so very broad question from ramya how can we make use of the shared history with our nar- maritime neighbors to spread our influence and power so well i mean it's a shared history interestingly <clears throat> our neighbors are very proud of it hmm. so when indonesia became free at 1949 from dutch rule it named itself indonesia right it, its national symbol is the garuda of garuda yeah of vishnu um uh, uh, and uh, you know its currency is named after rupee rupiah um and you have many others i mean singapore is named singapura lion city so there are many linkages and they are quite proud of it um you know uh, even today there is a hindu community of chams in vietnam 
who are Shaivites and so on and so forth. So there is a lot of linkages. The problem is the Indians don't know about it. In fact, I was quite surprised uh, how few Indians know about it. In fact, with ocean, one of the successes of my book, Ocean of Churn, was I think many Indians for the first time realized these linkages. And the reason, I think it's very sad, but uh, you know, our, our textbooks of history that we usually read are almost entirely continental history. So, and you know, it's one, and most of it is about one invader, then another invader and yet another invader and so on. Uh, again, the reason for that is very obvious because we have continued a colonial narrative which wanted to essentially tell us that you Indians have never been free. You have always mm. been ruled by somebody. Everything you're proud of has been given by somebody else. Therefore, your natural state is that we will rule you. Mm. And so this history was created and set up in this way. And I'll give, and just to show you how, since you're in Mumbai, you will appreciate it. If you read our textbooks, you will get the impression that the British conquered India from the Mughals, who were also foreigners. But in fact, the British did not conquer India from the Mughals. The Mughal Empire went into severe decline after Aurangzeb's death in 1707. Yes. From that point on, the Marathas ruled most of India. Okay, and they ruled all the way from Tanjavur in the south, all the way to Atok in the north at one stage, including Delhi. There is a Maratha period in Delhi, which nobody knows about. Yes, yes. And it is only after the third Anglo Maratha war that the British became the paramount power in the early 19th century. So there was a 70 year, 80 year period where the Marathas ruled large parts of India from coast to coast, by the way, from Odisha to Gujarat. And this bit of history has been happily left out of the storyline. It's only recently and that that catchphrase has been coming out, Katak to attack. Yeah, yeah. Cut up, cut up. yeah. Uh, so this this is not a catchphrase of recent history. This is there. No, no it okay. is not. A, it's there in uh, Maratha history even at that time. I stand 18th, corrected. It's an 18th century term. Okay. I forget who wrote this, but the 18th century um, writings which have this. And of course, they uh, you know we know of Tipu Sultan being defeated by the British. Yes. But they're not told that the Marathas were equal partners in that. Uh, so it was actually, uh, you know, the, the Malayalis from Tavankore coming from the south, from the north, the, the, uh, the, the coalition of uh, the Marathas with the, uh, uh, the Nizam of Hyderabad, and from the east, they were attacked by the British. So it was a coalition that defeated Tipu Sultan. And um, since the British wrote subsequent history, we are only told the British won that war. So, it's really pleasing to see many, many historians, including you, sir, uh, try to upset these so-called stories that we've been held, uh, that have been drilled down in us in centuries. So, more power to you. I think we re we've reached the end of the questions. If you'd like to make any overall closing comments before I request... No, Marat I... I I mean, uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, many of the places I mentioned in my talk are places you can happily go and visit. Um, do, you know, don't take my word on any of the things I said. So you can visit Dholavira, you can visit Mahabalipuram, and you can visit uh, Chandraketu Gard, and uh, you know, uh, and many of the dozens of other places I mentioned al along the way that uh, uh, in my talk. Uh, and there is a book called Ocean of Churn, which uh, yes. has the longer history with more, much more detail. But in every one of the cases, uh, you know, I have visited almost 90% of the places I talk about. So do visit some of them. They are very, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for your time. And thank you, everybody, for attending. Do attend more walks.